London's bomb scarred St. Paul's Cathedral is the scene of a memorial service to Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Outstanding world figures are in attendance. London's Lord Mayor and party arrive. Following them are Generals Montague and Weeks, representing CMHQ. Kings and queens of five nations pay homage to the memory of a great leader. Tears are in the eyes of Britain's Prime Minister as he recalls great moments with a real friend. Netherlands Queen and Princess Juliana and our own royal family wear mourning for the occasion. For the first time in history, an American ambassador, Mr. J.G. Wynant, reads the lesson in the ancient cathedral. The sentiments of the congregation of 2000 are reflected in the words of St. Paul's Dean. We render thanks to Almighty God for the services which President Roosevelt gave to the welfare and peace, not only of his own people, but of all the peoples of the world. So passes a great man. At McGill University in the city of Montreal, Dr. Cyril James, principal, and Dean Cyrus McMillan welcome their first class of this war's veterans. The occasion marks the opening of the initial special university course for Canada's fighting men at the world-famous Institute of Higher Learning. The engineering building is the classroom for the bulk of the ex-service students. Science is the preferred study of most of the lads, with lady professors to impart the knowledge of physics, staying after school for special instruction is a pleasure. Under the new educational scheme, the usual four-year course will be completed in three. To do this, the faculty will work overtime, staying on during the summer months. Taking up his education where he left off in 1939, Johnny Canuck is rapidly making up the time he lost during the years of his fight for freedom. The heavy recovery section, RCEME, does a man-sized job in reclaiming knocked out vehicles. Anything up to the heaviest tanks and transport are rescued to fight another day. Each recovery presents its own problems, so there is no book of rules. From the field, they are transported back to a recovery park where they are classified as repairable or not repairable. Those of no further use are stripped and their parts used for repairs. In the park, all kinds of vehicles and guns are found. ticklish job is handled by the armorers. A 25-pounder has a live HE shell stuck in the barrel. The barrel is removed and carted away, but carefully. The ammunition examiner packs it with explosives and adds an electrically detonated fuse. The charged barrel is buried in a slit trench and thus disposed of. Jeep parts are always in demand. As soon as a wrecked pneumonia special comes in, it disintegrates rapidly. Our supply routes are kept clear for the advance, thanks to the hard-working recovery sections of the Army's youngest corps. Men of the 1st Canadian Parachute Battalion forge ahead into Germany. Fighting as a unit of the 6th Airborne Division, they seldom go short of dairy products while Jerry farms are still functioning. Riding on British tanks, the force strikes out in a general northeasterly direction. Their goal is the German North Sea ports. Advancing with their British buddies, Town after town is captured as the enemy pulls out in general retirement. Graven, Wiedenzoll, Zuta, and Verlta are taken and cleared of snipers. Up to 25 mile advances are made on foot in a day, thanks to the stamina of tough allied paratroopers. Some of the enemy are in no condition to surrender. 
Others, after a stubborn defense, yield to the inevitable. All but the most fanatic are willing to admit that Hitler's castle has crumbled. Allied paratroopers are now engaged in the final house cleaning. Stalag 6C near Meppen, Germany, is captured by the rapid 4th Canadian Armored Div advance. Its scenes of utter horror will forever be engraved in the minds of its liberators. 2,500 Russian prisoners of war died of starvation and TB in one month in this home of the living dead. Scenes of daily life before liberation are reenacted by those prisoners able to walk for cameramen of the Canadian Army newsreel. Regardless of disability, all were forced to parade daily. Latecomers were attacked by a large German police dog as sport for the camp commandant. A slice of hard, dry bread and a few spoons full of watery soup was the daily ration. Privileged prisoners could scramble in the swill from German messes for tidbits. The dead were thrown into a pit by their comrades who were scarce able to move. When Germany's people are judged for their crimes, not the least of them will be the inhuman treatment of prisoners in Stalag 6C. General Krirar plans the offensive of his 1st Canadian Army in their drives into Germany and Northern Holland. In one arm of the thrust, tanks of the 4th Canadian Armored Div drive across the Dortmund Ems Canal to the town of Meppen, Germany. Opposition is light as our armor moves on the town. Inside the town of Zogel, a terrific counter-attack is launched by a recently formed paratroop battalion of fanatical young Germans. Hiding in houses and behind any available obstacle, they have to be flushed out in close quarter fighting. Non-combatant units aid in the task. German civilians who fired on our troops are rounded up and forced to read Allied proclamations. Meanwhile, another prong of our offensive strikes northwest into Holland. Their immediate objective is the town of Deventer. A great contrast in receptions is afforded by the Dutch people. In Germany, we are conquerors, but in Holland, we are liberators and friends. Venter and Zutphen, Canadians mass to cross the Isel River. Initial bridgeheads are established by waterborne troops who make the crossing in Buffalo. Even rafts are used to get supporting armor to the far bank. Under intense shelling, the engineers construct a pontoon bridge for the light traffic. Soon vehicles of all kinds augment the force of the attack. Further south on the Isel River, troops of a British div launch their thrust to take the never to be forgotten town of Arnhem. Canadian guns fire in support. Rounds of ammunition from Canadian guns clear the way for British infantry to take Arnhem. It's a great day for the Tommies. At long last, they have taken revenge for their airborne comrades. They are back on ground hallowed by the memory of the men who wrote a new page in gallantry, the men of Arnhem. 